Welcome to Sydney Business Month 2013, September, and Fiona will be taking us away. Fiona. Hi everybody, it's Fiona from Super Savvy Business and thank you so much for joining our show. We're going to be broadcasting live every Tuesday for the next four weeks at 11 o'clock and I'm going to be bringing to you some experts to help you understand what you can do to grow your business in the online world. So today we have Kurt Johansson. Now, Kurt is one of these amazing gurus who knows everything there is to know about his topic and his topic is email marketing. Now I'm going to give you a bit of a background about Kurt just so you have an appreciation for the value he's going to bring to us today. Now he's been the general manager of his business consultancy firm Johansson International Proprietary Limited for the past 13 years where he helps small to medium businesses with strategy, marketing and personal issues. He has an extensive business background including 21 years in the Commonwealth Bank through branch management, regional management and eventually to the position of general manager training. He then entered into retail sales and was personally responsible for over a million dollars in sales of animation artwork. Kurt re-entered the corporate training field and is now used extensively to facilitate throughout Australia in sales, leadership and business management courses. But Kurt found a need for his business clients to undertake a more worthwhile marketing activities and, but they had a reluctance to do so due to cost. So he immersed himself into email marketing and he's now considered one of the leading Australian experts in email marketing. Kurt has written over 200 posts, three Kindle books and numerous papers on email marketing and is the go-to guy most small to medium business owners seek out when it comes to this area. He's a sought after seminar speaker um, and he makes helps people to learn how to make money from email marketing. So I'm guessing that you can take a, take a really good uh, impression of how expert Kurt is on this topic of email marketing and I'm absolutely thrilled to bring him on as our first guest for the Super Savvy Business Show for Sydney Business Month. Welcome Kurt. Fiona, hello and uh, welcome everybody listening. Kurt, um, look, you've, I've seen the slides for uh, your show today and rather than having your webcam on, we're going to be showing some slides because you've got some really, really valuable information and I know that by the end of this session, our listeners will have a really good idea about you know, how they can use email marketing in their business but most importantly, how they can do it legally and not cross those delicate lines of going into the world of spam. So I'd just like to hand it over to you, Kurt. Thanks, Fee. Um, everybody, thank you for, for listening today. It's uh, terrific that you're here. What I thought I'd take us through on this uh, next half hour to 40 minutes is how you can use email marketing in your business and do it legally without spamming your customers. The majority of my clients now uh, email regularly and uh, certainly fill their inboxes up with some useful amount of cash but the main thing about it also is that they're providing useful information to their customers so they're not seen as spammers and I think this is pretty important. What we've got here is a range of slides and we're going to make those available for those who would like them so they can look at uh, the slides later and continue on their education as well and learning about email marketing. So during this presentation, what you're going to learn is what, I what is email marketing? Actually, what's it all about? And you know, that's really important to get your head around what email marketing is about. We're going to be looking at the Spam Act including three critical points to stay legal and the majority of people I know don't want to enter into email marketing because they say it's about spamming and how do you know if you're legal. Well I'm going to clarify and demystify some of the myths today for you. What we're also going to do though is look at the penalties if you do get it wrong so it's about doing it correct and making sure that you stay on the right side of what the laws stay we can do. Uh, there are seven real benefits of e email marketing, well, I'll take you through each of those and one of the things also is if you decide to go into email marketing, there are programs that you should consider to use in your business so I've listed five here and one in particular that I use, I'll be talking a little bit about that one and I'll also help you about how to write and format your emails and what to do if you need help because we could listen to these type of programs and at the end there's many questions that people like to continue on with last so we're certainly going to help you to go and uh, get some help if you need some more after the program. 
Well, okay. Kurt, the, mate, I, I hope I hope everyone's got their pen and paper ready because it sounds like there's going to be lots of gold nuggets here. Uh, it's going to be content driven, Fiona, and really that's what it's about. While we're here today, is to help people go out on their own. I'm pretty sure that when they they finish listening to this broadcast, they'll be able to jump into email marketing themselves. But if they would like some help, then we we'll certainly offer and uh, a way that they can get that as well. Fantastic. Okay, so the first thing I'd like you to really think uh, about here is that what you're going to hear. Is it's take it on board and have an open mind. So I like to throw in a slide like this where it's really about staying open and don't sit there saying email marketing won't work for me because it'll work for any business and I'm just going to help you understand how that can uh, how they can get it, go about to do it. That's probably the easiest way. So have an open mind everybody. That's the main thing. So let's go on first and, and look at what is email marketing. Basically what it is, it's using email to create immediate cash surges and what we mean by that is that if you're looking for some sales to happen immediately, you need some cash into the business then you can venture into an email marketing or email marketing campaigns but more so than that, you can use email just to drive traffic to your website and that website you may have specials on there, you may have other posts depending on what type of website you are, you've got. Uh, most email marketers around the world use it to drive traffic over to a website website and it can certainly be used that way if that's the way you wish to but more so for me is to keep in contact with customers. In the old days we talk about sending letters out, we'd be talking flyers and pamphlets but with email it can be so personal and so quick it's just an easy and quick way to keep in contact with customers and the reason I ventured down this path for many years ago was my clients weren't doing any marketing or weren't contacting the customers at all and I just thought that was dopey is that there is this medium called email and if we do it right we can still keep in contact with our customers and be at the front of mind with them. One of the other things you need to, what can happen with email marketing also is that you can send out special sales campaigns to your customers uh, and that's a very important, especially Father's Day in Australia just went past so many of my clients and myself are sending out special Father's Day campaigns. Father's Day sales campaigns because people are going to spend on Father's Day so why not put your product and your service in front of your customers. It's also about email marketing is you can bring in non-customers. So what we mean by that is there may be people who have registered to gather information from you depending on what type of business you have, whether it be a retail store or somebody just gaining some information of or a brochure from your site. So you can keep in contact with what a class says non-customer. These are probably prospects in a real sense. They have yet to buy so you can keep in contact with them and provide them with additional information to eventually turn them into a customer. Uh, you can also use email marketing to do a newsletter. Uh, some of my clients use weekly newsletters, some do monthly newsletters but it certainly enables you to be in contact with them on a more of a formal basis if you wish a newsletter to go out. And to me though the key about email marketing is that I can't stress this um, highly enough. It's always about the list and that's your customers. It's about the relationship you have with your list and then you've got a right to make the offer and I'll show you later on how I particularly do it in email campaigns but I really want to stress the, the point here. It's not about sending out emails for a sale, a sale, a sale, a sale all the time. I'm about providing people with value with the information in the emails you send them and then eventually you have the right to ask for a sale or give them an offer. So it's about value, 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 then you can start asking them for a sale. So there's a key to handling yeah. email marketing correctly. Yeah, Sorry, Fiona. I'm, no, I was going to say I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up because yesterday um, when we did a hangout for Sydney Business Month, we were talking about this same concept of giving, giving, giving and, and providing massive value to your, to your customers and your leads. I think it's so important. It's that it's not not about us just sending an email saying I've got something on special, do you want to buy it? It's really about getting into the head of your audience and your clients and, and uh, segmenting them down which I'll show during these slides and then saying what valuable information can I provide those people? Uh, for instance, what I, I send out emails generally two 
times a week at the minimum and the majority of the times is providing people with information how they can effectively use email marketing in their business and then occasionally I'll be having in, look if you do need help I do coach. Um, I've got some other products or services that you may also want to get your hands on but really it's about helping people. That's, that's the way to use email marketing. Fantastic. Okay, so let's have a look what you're allowed to do with emails. That's probably the first thing to do. And I want to take you through uh, a couple of the acts. In Australia, we use the SPAM Act of 2003. And in the United States, they talk about the CAN SPAM Act. So these are the two acts that we should really be looking at in Australia. Uh, they are different, but they're very, very similar. So I'm going to give you an overview of the SPAM Act of 2003, which most people in listening to this call uh, are Australians obviously with the Sydney Business Month uh, but we will touch on the CAN SPAM Act as well. Okay so what does the SPAM Act cover and this is the Australian SPAM Act of 2003. It actually covers uh, it says about the SPAM Act, it's just not email. So it certainly covers email, these laws, but it also covers SMS. And a lot of people don't understand that because we're now getting more into SMS marketing and, and I certainly use that with my clients and, and very effectively as well. But it is a case that it covers email, SMS. It also covers MMS, if you're going to send some sort of video through. And it talks about instant messaging. So the SPAM Act is more than just talking about emails. What it doesn't cover, it doesn't cover letters. So you can go, the Spam Act doesn't cover any letters that traditionally you'd send out to people. It doesn't cover any flyers or pamphlets that you would like to traditionally put in a letterbox or you might receive from a supermarket chain. Um, telemarketing calls are not covered by the Spam Act. Um, any pop-up, if you have internet pop-ups and you know there's whether they work or not work these days but any pop-ups certainly are covered by the Spam Act uh, and what it is, any non-commercial messages which avoid a link. Now this is pretty important, you can't be guilty of spamming if it's a non-commercial message or email to a person and there's no link that you're going to be sending person to a web website to try to sell. The, the Spam Act is talking about commercial messages. So you can't be guilty of spamming and just sending a uh, hello, how are you to different people. That's a really good distinction to understand, I guess, because you know, especially if you are in the, um, in the mindset of giving good quality content to people but you're not necessarily saying come and buy, does, does that where these sorts of emails can fall in? Oh, absolutely. The um, and it's a, this question is about a void of links. So you can't be really nice to people. I want to give you this information. Have somewhere in the email. By the way, click on here. It takes you to a website, and there's something for sale. This is um, uh, it's got to be void of those type of links. But you can certainly send out messages to people and let them know about what you what you can what they could maybe do. And um, for instance, uh, the one that comes to my mind, if you're in selling baby prams or any of the baby goods, if you sent out um, some information about how a pram works or how to clean certain clothes, etc., and there's nothing there to suggest there's any sale being intended, but it's advice, then that would not be classed as a commercial message. If you were sending someone back to your blog page where there was a post, where there was further information or perhaps a demonstration video, but on a separate page there was commercial intent, would you be allowed to do that or not? Uh, it would be it would be close, but um, really it comes down to what I mentioned before, the list and the relationship. If you have yes. the relationship with the, the person and they wish to click through that to look at the, to the post to, to look at that video, then I'm pretty sure they won't be placing you into the hands of the authorities about spamming anyway. So that's why we always talk about the relationship before the offer is so important. Yeah, that's really good clarification. Thanks for that, Kurt. Okay. Um, now, let's have a look at this because most people here in Australia, the Spam, and, sp the Spam Act of 2003 talks about this as jurisdiction. If you're in Australia and you're sending messages out of Australia, so overseas, and I've certainly got clients in the States and I know um, for you talk to a lot of people um, outside of Australia as well. So what occurs is that once you're sending an email outside of Australia, you're still covered by the Australian Spam Act of 2003. Likewise, somebody overseas is sending messages into us are covered by the Act. But the hard part about would probably be the authorities trying to track them down to, to enforce any regulations, but the, 
the Spam Act of 2003 talks about incoming and outgoing emails are all covered by the Act. So I mean, for those, if, you're, mm -hmm. if you're sending uh, to an overseas jurisdiction where they have their own Spam Acts, uh, yep. do you need to be aware of those as well or are, you, are we just bound by the Australian ones? Uh, we'd be bound by both and that's where I mentioned earlier about the Can Spam Act for Americans because of most of our trade from Australian business can be over there. Uh, I'm certainly aware that with there's Asian connections. However, in the commercial world and certainly the internet, the US market is very huge for us. So we need to be abide by the Can Spam Act as well. Wow, there's so much to get your head around, isn't there? Yeah. And yet it's nothing to fear and, and I'm going to help go through this on what it really means. If people follow these simple steps, then I'm sure they're going to be okay. Fantastic. Well, let's roll to the next bit then. <laughs> okay. Now let's look at the penalties first if they get it wrong. So let's scare people first. Um, if you get it wrong, you could be fined in Australia up to $220,000 per day for getting your email marketing incorrect. Um, there's a maximum of $1.1 million and the, the, the Act also talks about other court action could be taken as well. Now people can use their own imaginations what other court action there could be but it's a pretty hefty fine if you get it wrong. So it, it really is a case of getting our head around it, not be fearful and then uh, abiding by what the laws state. So let's have a look at that. So, well, first off, sorry, let's have a look at the purpose of the Act. And what was happened was the unsolicited commercial messages were on the rise. And when the Act came out in Australia in 2003, what they were talking about is that there was so much spamming happening. Now, that's 10 years ago. So it's, a lot's been cleaned up these days, but that's the purpose of why the, the Act was written in the first place, is to get rid of these unsolicited commercial messages. And uh, Fiona, yourself and I would receive many in our inboxes, and, you know, it's a matter of trying to block them, remove them, and, and ISPs tend to block them for us a lot these days. But, you know, they still get through, but there certainly isn't that many that used to be. Um, one of the things also what uh, the Act tried to do was to preserve legitimate business messages so people can converse with each, uh, with each other conveniently and quickly and do it in a way that uh, is accepted and uh, was welcomed. Uh, and it was about encouraging people to use email responsibly. So the three critical points to stay legal, and, and this is really what the Australian Spam Act of 2003 talks about. It talks about one is that you must have consent to send an email. The second one talks about you must identify yourself and the third point was you must have an easy unsubscribe system. So if we can get our head around these, consent, identify and unsubscribe and I'll expand that a little bit further for everybody listening. And there are some easy ways to do this, aren't there Kurt? Oh absolutely, yes and it's again, I'll stress don't fear this, if you just know this what you need to do and follow then you'll be fine. The main thing about consent is this is what we generally see in consent, people are friendly, they know each other and there's a consent say hey let's stay in business, let's stay in contact but consent goes a little bit further for email marketing. It talks about two types of consents. One's express consent and the other is inferred consent. So if we get our head around express consent first. Express consent is where somebody has subscribed to a list. So on your site, Fiona, on my website as well, people can download information and they're putting in their name and handing over an email address. Well, they're subscribed to a list. So you've got express consent to send them messages. And this is what also happens? what's commonly known as the opt-in, isn't it? Correct, yes, where people have opted in to receive messages. So that's what we call express consent. Um, people may have ticked a box to receive electronic messages. There could be, um, that could be paper format in a retail store that you might have a form that people sign and say, yep, we're quite happy to receive electronic messages, so it's express consent. And it's really where um, uh, the person may have requested material over the phone as well, saying they've rang up a shop or a store or a business and said, look, we would like that and that us have you got a, an email address, we'd like to send that out to you via email. Well, you've given express consent to receive information from that business. Inferred consent 
it's not so much grey as a lot of people who I talk to think it's a little bit iffy, but these are the rules straight from the Spam Act of 2003. Basically, it talks about if you had a previous client and they've provided an electronic uh, address before, then there's an inferred consent that you could contact them about your business. Now, you must be talking about a business to business type relationship. So you, you can't bring in something that they're not used to knowing what you're from, so or what you use or what your products and services are. It's about the relationship you had before, so you can re contact them. Um, if people purchase goods or services and they provide an electronic address to do so, to, to be contacted, and they give up freely, and that's probably the, the, the way to look at that, they freely give up that address. Um, if people just go online and register for some product information, you then have inferred consent that you can um, email market to them. So in Other consent, really, does that, I take it that's not including, you know, you go to a business networking meeting and uh, share your business card and all of a sudden you're on someone's uh, email list? It, it could, because let's have a look at this, because there's the further examples are if a conspicuously, okay, it's hard for me to say, published <laughs> email address. So it, it's out in the open, it's in the mar marketplace. So people might have a um, an ad in a paper or the yellow pages or an advertisement somewhere for their business and they put up their email address and it's conspicuous, then you do have an inferred consent that you could contact them if your products and services relate to their business. So, so if someone has an email address on their website, for example, is that inferred consent? It could, it could um, certainly go that way. You're not allowed to harvest email addresses, so you can't use software programs to go and dig for email um, addresses out of websites. That's particularly banned. But if you went to a website and saw their email address and it was conspicuous where it was, where it was placed, you could contact them from business to business as long as your product and service relates to theirs. So there's got to be that reason why you're contacting them. Okay, so that's really good to understand I guess because let's say I was looking for a new client, a new web website client um, and I found somebody who had a, a poor quality site and they had their email address on their site. Is it okay for me to then contact that person to solicit work? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It would be because what you'd be talking to them about is saying, I've looked at your site, I've been there, I've, I've seen this, and this is what the service and that we provide. So again, it would be the way that you would write the email and the introduction. It'd be like sending out a letter to them in the mail, which isn't covered by the Spam Act. You could certainly do that by email to them as well. Uh, because it's a business to business. But yeah, and this is the, the distinction here is that you haven't harvested the the address off a, um, off a with a software and then sent out 100,000 emails. What you've done is is targeted somebody who could use your products and services and there's a direct relationship to them. Fantastic. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. The other thing, and here's your business card one. Now, ah. the business card has been offered or supplied. So, at a network meeting, um, if a person is handing over a card and you're saying, I'm, I'm comfortable for you to, to contact me, then that's different. It's what you couldn't do really is say, drop a card in to try to win a prize and then get bombarded by that company from email marketing because they, it's been offered for the prize, not for me to be you know, uh, contacted for you and uh, continuously about products and services that you're offering. Mate, I was just going into a prize draw. So you have to be careful in those sort of circumstances. But if I'm sitting at a if I'm sitting at a network meeting and we swap cards, then there's an inferred consent that you would like to hear from me. Otherwise, you wouldn't have given me your business card. Fantastic. Okay. So that's all those people that have uh, got all, you know hundreds of business cards sitting in their drawers from all the networking and business meetings they've been to. Then you can actually do something with those. Oh, well, absolutely. The it's the question on how far you particularly go and what was the relationship at the time you received the card. If you if you've gone there and and people say, have you got your card? Have you got your card? Have you got your card? And you're collecting all these to go and start some email marketing campaign. It could be considered that it's not really inferred consent. I'm talking about when you're having a discussion with somebody and they say, by the way, have you got a card? Yeah, sure. That you may wish to contact those people later about a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So that's the uh, there's a distinction there. Yes. Okay. 
Um, the reason the distinction needs to be there because you'd only be contacting them for messages pertaining to their business. So you'd be taking it up and saying, hi Fiona, we met last week or we met two days ago at the network meeting, thought I'd continue the conversation with you, is that okay? And then again you would then uh, supply a little bit more about the products and services for them. Okay, that's so, a really good way to follow up, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's um, You've received the card, you've got it there, do something with it. So um, an email is... Whilst it's personal, it's also uh, a little bit uh, impersonal is that you, you, people f could find it easy to write. That's what I mean is that you've got the business card. Do I phone the person up? No, it might, they might be in error. I'll send them an email and give them a little bit more advice. All right, uh, further examples of inferred consent is if people are shareholders of the business, then you know, they would, uh, the company would have the right to send them email communications. Um, if you were a magazine or newspaper subscriber, then there's an inferred consent there. Uh, registered use of online services, subscribers to information or advisory services, financial members of any sort of association or club, you have the right to um, contact them. Uh, contractors is another way, and any professional association members. So the the the. SPAM Act of 2003 goes a little bit further and saying we would consider these would be inferred consent that you would be able to contact them by electronic means. Um, but you need to take a bit of care here. There might be some one-off purchases like someone might go online to, to order a movie ticket and or a retail store or a restaurant and what's reason here is that the that um, ticket is going to be sent back to people via an email. So they haven't really freely given their electronic address. They've had to give an, elect an electronic address to get the information or to get the ticket, if you know what I mean. So you can go online and say, you know, we'll email you the ticket. So I've got the ticket. I want to go to the movies. Well, that doesn't give you the right to keep bombarding me now. I just wanted to buy a ticket. So you have to be careful in those sort of circumstances. Um, probably the easiest way I could bring that out, um, recently um, I went to a play and the only way you could get the tickets was to go online to get these tickets and I only just wanted to go to see this play. So it doesn't give the theatre a right to send me everything on a, all their plays for right on. Now I would personally worry about that but that's where you have to be a little bit careful about what goes on. But you could add in on um, when they buy the ticket or the ticket coming through, would, would you like to receive other information about plays that we have coming up uh, from time to time? And that would be a toggle switch or a tick box that you would tick. Yeah, and I often see those. So, yeah, I guess that's the way around it, isn't it? For those oh, absolutely. purchase clients. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look now. That's the consent. Let's look at, about identify. And what it means by identify is that you've got to give your company name and you've got to give your contact details. Now very much in uh, the CAN-SPAM Act in America, this is very important. You've got to have both of these uh, on everything that you send out. And one of the things here is that it covers more than just an email. Any electronic letters that you send out, any quotes that you send out, any invoices that you send out, you must have your company name and your address on those. And that address must be valid for 30 days as well, which is a, an interesting part they put in the Act. So you can't just say, yeah, I've got a PO box and then close it down. That, that You must know that that address for people to respond to will be valid for 30 days. And I don't see why it wouldn't be, but I suppose spammers might open up box PO boxes and close them down after three days and say, well, it was available at the time. Yeah. So any of your quotes, and I, look, that's interesting because I, I have different clients who send out messages to people and say, well, you're now talking about this is a commercial message, so make sure you put your name and your full address there. And generally they have those in footers and headers and signatures and just make sure that's all part of the deal. Okay, the third part about uh, to make sure you're, you're cover, covered by the Act is have un, an unsubscribe situation. Now the unsubscribe button, what it virtually says is it's just got to be clear and easy to use. You don't have to have an electronic unsubscribe method in your emails. 
However, the programs we use certainly uh, puts it there for you. But um, what you've got to make it easy for people. And, and I myself have complained from people that I've sort of subscribed to various forms of um, subscriptions and I've tried to unsubscribe and then they take me through about three or four pages and um, it's just not what the act says. You've got to go and get very clear and very easy to use. So somebody should be able to just reply back and saying remove me from the list and then you've got five working days to remove them. So um, my suggestion is remove them within 24 hours or straight away. Uh, yeah. When people do come off my list, um, I act on it virtually straight away. And the reason I do that, I want to have a clean list as well. And that's one way where you can limit your spamming with businesses or with ISPs is that you keep a clean list. Now, just to be clear, Kurt, uh, that unsubscribe option needs to be accessible in the email itself, doesn't it? Yes, it's, you've, they've got to find a way to get out. And most of the programs that you can get electronically might have an automatic one, so they click on a button, it takes them out. But some people are loath to click those, so they'll reply by saying, remove me off the list. So what I particularly do is that, and that does happen, and, and Tom, we don't fear that because it just means they've time to move on. They, they don't want to become your client. They may not, not buy from you, so I'm, I'm quite happy for them to disappear. Um, I'll always remove them and I'll send an email back to say that they have been removed and show them that it has. So I like doing that side of it when people come personally and not hit the automatic button. I'll reply back once more to say that, you know, thank you for your email. Um, you have been sub, um, unsubscribed from this list. And I just want them to be to know that it's. I think sometimes too, Kurt, it's a good idea to get some feedback from people as to why they may have unsubscribed. Um, you know, whether it was because they were receiving too many emails or whether the emails just weren't relevant to them. Because um, I think, um, as a business owner, it's important to understand why people are unsubscribing. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, I certainly don't do it myself, but I appreciate what you're saying. Is that I don't do it via the email. Other clients who, um, for my for my clients where we lose customers, we certainly try to get an idea what's happening. Um, in the email world with the number of emails or subscribers I have, I must have been of guilty. I don't go there to find out why. I could send them a, a survey. I'm just happy to oblige, but I do <laughs> let them know that they have been removed. So, but great point what you're talking about. It certainly makes sense in business. Okay, well, what are the, yep. No, I was going to say, it just gives you a little bit of feedback as to, you know, if you are going wrong somewhere in your email marketing, um, you know, to get that bit of feedback from people to say, well, maybe we're sending emails too, too often or maybe the content is really not relevant to the target market. So I, I think it's, it's quite a valuable process to go through. Oh, most valuable, yeah, for sure. Okay, so what are the seven real benefits of email marketing? First, it increases sales. There's no doubt about that. The, the net of um, products and... Uh, services that uh, I've been selling for clients over many years now. It's yeah, it's 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 frightening how much extra sales come through. If people knew the number, and I'm talking, you know, we're well and truly in the seven-figure numbers that we sell by emails. Um, it reduces marketing costs because once you've got your list together and you can send out multiple um, messages to people, it's certainly a lot cheaper than sending out letters. Uh, for instance, I had a, uh, a chap who uh, engaged my services from Melbourne um, last year and we'd worked out that I'd sent him something like 187 emails because he was on my list before he actually said, uh, yep, this is good. Uh, I want to use you and we had a bit of a chuckle about it because I said you've been on my list for three years and you know you received about 187 emails he said yes I know I, I haven't read them all but I've read most and I said there's no way I could have sent you 187 letters I would have given up it's um and that's the the great thing about the redu reduction in marketing costs that email provides um, it certainly builds customer loyalty because you can give them information that they're after. It shortens the sales cycles. And one of the, the great things I've got here in the, the sales cycles, to give you an idea, I've got a hotel um, chain, a group of hotels on my books who are my clients, and uh, we did a, a special um, one particular month, and it was about a, a one-half-litre Jim Beam bottle, and we're sending out, we found out one of their competitors 
had cut the price. So we simply changed the email. We did also did SMS campaigns and threw in two liters of coke at the same time, or two by two <laughs> liters of coke. So I got four liters of coke plus plus that because we could see the big chain and put it in the newspaper. Um, we'd normally well they told us told me they normally sell between three and four. Uh, bottles of any specials they do on Jim Beam. That particular special, we sold something like 33 um, loads. Now, if you take the difference between three to 33, that's 11 times more, and the percentages and the, and the extra, and the loyalty it actually brings, and that's just the shortened sales cycle. We could say, here's our price first. No, we're changing it tomorrow, and people just flocked in at it. Uh, four litres of coke, it got a lot of people in the door. It you know, amazing. it's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Just sometimes the simplest of ideas um, can really just change a whole campaign. Yeah, and the, and the reason I wanted to mention that is because the other competitor put a big full page ad in the paper. Well, they couldn't do anything till the following Thursday. And this is where email marketing can can win. Because you can respond immediately, can't you? You can change your tact, you can get out there, you know, and like, as you say, if you've, if you've got to have an ad in the newspaper, then there's a, the lead time is so much longer. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that's the great thing that we work off is uh, we can change, we can add to it, you know, within 24 hours, within three hours, within, you know, like here's another change. So it's it's easily done. Uh, just to generate referrals, because what we actually put on that campaign also was tell your friends about it. So um, rather than cutting out a, a, something out of a piece of paper, they can just afford to a friend or flick it over to somebody. So you do get other people coming in. And the automation, you can save time. You can load up emails in advance, do your campaigns in, a, in advance, and um, your branding and penetration certainly is getting out there a lot more to people because it's over. It's, it's repetitive stuff that you can, um, you can send to people. Well, now you're getting into the one of the topics that I really love about email marketing, which is moving towards the automation side of things. Ah, oh, yes, it's, um, it's it's important that automation people understand is that you can uh, what I call batch process. You can write a whole series of emails and load them up and have them triggered to go at certain intervals down the track, and you can just walk away. Um, Let's see how to perform email marketing. This is really about the automation here, is that you need to have a system to manage the lists of customers and clients, and one also that can collect names automatically. So when you do have your opt-in boxes on your websites, the names get captured, goes directly inside these automated systems. Um, what you also would like to, to point out now, if you're going to enter into email marketing, don't use Gmail addresses, Yahoo addresses, Hotmail. Now, I'm not saying these aren't bad email addresses to have, and the reason we're on this hangout because we've got Gmail accounts. Uh, they're great, but they're no good to email market because they don't use professionalism for me. So for me, if you receive an email, it will come from Kurt at Johansson International. So what I'm saying there is you get your company, buy your domain name, and then use something in around that and personalise it. Don't use admin or sales or those type of generic email addresses. Use a per, your, your first name or somebody's name and your business name as your email address to send to and respond to for email marketing. I'm really glad you brought that up, Kurt, because even to this day, I still see a lot of business owners still using Yahoo and, and Gmail and Hotmail for their business emails. What I would like to clarify, guys, for our listeners today, though, is that doesn't mean you can't use Gmail as your email client. You can actually set up Gmail for business and have all your official business emails coming in through email, uh, through Gmail, which is what I do. So even though you receive emails from me with my supersavvybusiness.com email address, it's actually filtering through my Gmail account. Yeah, and that's important. It's it's what the they see when it hits their inbox. So yeah. we want we want them to see your domain name or your business name. Okay, um, use a professional platform to send your emails. Here's here's four. They all work beautifully, and they all have certain price points. There's Aweber. There's eye contact. There's get response. There's Infusionsoft. These are ones that work really well. Um, you can go and learn those to see how to use it. There are some downsides, um, and there are some pluses. For me, though, to send email or to use email marketing, and I've used all of these or know all about these type of programs. 
Um, I use and recommend one called Smart Email Marketing. Um, down beside it's run by my good friend out of Mel, uh, out of Melbourne, out of Perth, called Peter Butler. Uh, there's a URL down below. We've put up a page there that's got a little bit of a video, and Peter can take you through it, uh, on what it does. I also provide training on that if anybody would be interested. It's comparable in price, but what I like about it, it sends in real time every five minutes if you click an email the email will go out in real time. Some of the other programs you queue and wait for a load of other people to send first. You think your email's gone but it's like taxing for a plane. You, know, you get on a plane, you wave goodbye to your loved ones and then you find out later that they were stuck on the tarmac for, the, for two or three hours because there was too many planes in front of them. Well, that's what can happen to some of the other programs that are hosted out of America. You think it's gone, but you stay in the queue until it's your turn to go. One, I know with smart email marketing, um, what we do is, uh, well, Peter does it, it goes every five minutes. So once you're in the queue, five minutes have passed, you're gone. So that's why I particularly like it. And it's clean, it's simple, it's easy to use. Now these sorts of programs could, um, my, the people in my community will hear me talk about autoresponders and that's exactly what these uh, tools are. Um, and this is where you can use them to send live emails like you're talking about but also you can load up your email sequence and have them sent out automatically on your behalf um, with you know, the, 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 the time in between preset. Correct. This is an uh, this is an autoresponder. They're all yeah. autoresponders. So, uh, and that's really important, especially if you have an opt-in uh, sign-up box on your website, is that you can pre-program all of those emails, put it in the autoresponder, and they will be sent out after 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, etc. Yeah. And as business owners, you know, we're all so busy running, you know, the very important money-making sides of our business. So not having to worry about those emails and those follow-up sequences and to know that once somebody is in your system, they're automatically going to be sent the important information. It just takes a real load off, off your mind. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's all automated. It's brilliant. All right, so let's uh, have a look at also how to perform email marketing. Once you've got a system, you're able to send out personalised emails to your customers. You can track who reads them. I'm big on statistics to make sure there are some templates there that you can set up. I generally don't use a template myself just because of the HTML inside them. Um, I'd rather write a, a copy as we, we talk about personal emails, but templates, I've got many clients of mine that use the templates. Um, you can send out newsletters, special offers, there's surveys that you can do, there's just so many things, event registrations, and really to send out offers to segmented sublists. Um, and this is what I really mean by sublists. You can have a main list, and this is like one I did for a, a fish and chip shop owner of mine um, uh, as a client. What we said is that not everyone in the, who goes into their fish and chip shop likes fish, but some do. But then you can break it down. Garfish lovers, whiting lovers. Some people go in there because they make fantastic hamburgers, but some people go in to buy their vegetarian burgers. So if they know what their clients are and can target them um, with specific deals or, or offers, then it can really help the business. For instance, if, if people don't I would imagine, well I know, Tuesdays is not a great buying night for people to offer takeaway and places like Domino's know that because that's where they, they have their cheapest uh, pizzas on a Tuesday because not too many people are out. Well you could use the segmented list to, to sell a specific or make a specific offer to a sub list. So I'm really big in um, segmenting your list more than just having one major list. So that's one way that you could do it. I'm really glad that you brought that up because you know having a message that's targeted towards a specific segment of your database um, can really help in your marketing campaigns. So you know, for all our listeners out there, really think about you know you might have let's say a thousand people on your list, but those thousand people aren't all interested in the exact same side of your of your business. So think about how you can segment your list and send them offers and information which is going to be most relevant to to where they're at and what they're interested in. Yeah, and that's how you can get away from not spamming because you are selling, um, sending them relevant information. That's a good point, V. All right, so let's have a look at um, once you've got your program, it's essential to have email marketing strategies in place. Some of the questions that you really need to ask yourself is what do I wish to achieve from this campaign? Which clients do I wish to target? Will I send a series of emails or will it be a newsletter? 
uh, what regularity, um, and also I like the question, how will I know my campaign has been a success? So you've really got to think about strategy, it's just not about sending an email. And in particular, when I talk about strategy, um, I talk about email campaigns, and this is the way I particularly do it. There's a target right up the top, what do we wish to achieve, and then we can work backwards, and often we'd be sending three, four, or five emails out to achieve uh, that end target. And that's very important to understand the strategy behind this, and I call this my email step diagram. So it's never one email. Um, it's like getting a letter in the mail. It doesn't work that way. There should be a series of emails leading to an end point. Kurt, I know that we're, we're sort of running out of time very yep. quickly here, but I but I'm just wanted to clarify something. One of the biggest questions I'm asked by people within the super savvy business community is, how often should I be sending my emails out? How much is too much or how much is not enough? Yeah, and your client will determine that. I'll send emails out and I have regularly for two a week. So I know people that send them out one a week. Look, I would say you're sending them out because they're a friend. I would be sending out minimum of one per week. Um, once a month is not enough. Once a fortnight, I don't think that's enough. Um, so I'd be looking to set up some sort of regular conversation with your clients and that would be uh, one a week would be a say. If you can't handle that, you think that's too much, then try one a fortnight then. But um, it, the people will tell you if it's too much. And generally, we get hooked up on our own thinking, oh, I'm sending too much information. I've been known to send two emails, three emails in the one day. And um, I don't lose subscribers for it because it's what you're actually sending. It's yeah. the information that they're looking for. And it's and all they, part of the, what a campaign is. And they know that when they hear from Kurt, they're going to be getting quality information. So they're not going to be worried about it. Yeah. So. If anybody would like to know some more, I have written three more in-depth um, Kindle books. Now these are so affordable, it's like we're giving away, I think they're $4.95 or $4.99 or something and I'll put them up there because it's not a money thing, it's like to help business to get in. The first one, Seven Killer Tips to Email Success, tells you how to format your emails, how to write them and that's a very useful publication. The next one is that there are spam filters out there and how to beat them legitimately and how to get bypass some of those filters which I just think are just ludicrous that people, uh, techos can put all these algorithms in place to try to stop illegitimate emails. Um, so I help with that and then the third one there is that um, people, my clients are saying I don't know what to write. So there are only eight different email types and I'll reveal that all in that publication there. So there's some links as well that um, if you'd like to go and grab those, that's really going to help you. And I said, they're $4.99, so it's not a money thing for me. This is really about helping people. And you can grab those from my website um, at kurtjohansen.com. Um, also, if you'd like to know a little bit more, then on my website there is a contact page there. Uh, on the right-hand side, I've got it highlighted in, in orange on this slide, but you just click that. There's a message box up there. If you want to send me, anybody listening to this would like to send me some more information, I'll answer you personally uh, from your circumstance and I'll be able to help you there. Wow, guys, look, I, I'm sure everyone who's listened to uh, this, this uh, show today is in no doubt uh, that you really do know your stuff, Kurt, and the amount of golden nuggets that you've given away so freely today are incredibly valu valuable. So I'd just like to say thank you, and I would also like to strongly recommend any of the listeners to, to, on today's show to check out those books because I happen to know personally that the content that Kurt has in those is, is, is just so um invaluable to any business owner who's thinking about getting getting into email marketing or maybe already doing email marketing but maybe not getting the results that they want. So I think that brings us to the end of our show. Kurt, thank you so much. Um, now next week if you want to tune in tomorrow, uh, sorry, at next Tuesday at 11 a.m. we'll be having another show with Lee Usher, the, aka the social media babe, talking about using social media to grow your business. So thanks very much Kurt. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all again next week, Tuesday at 11 a.m. for the Sydney Business Month Super Savvy Business Show.